Hello, everyone. Thought I would come on here and share something interesting with you. This might be something that we could do from time to time. Is um, have you ever read a movie script online? I remember I had a job once where when things would get really slow, um, you know, it's not like I could sit there and read a book or anything like that. So I remember I started to read some movie scripts um, be and it uh, it was it was fun because I started to read some movies that like I had hadn't seen, and so I would read the movie script, and it was it was kind of cool because you of course you can visualize things in your head, you get the direction, uh, the setting, what's going on, things like that. Well, I thought I wonder. Oh, and well, the reason why I thought this is because I remember reading certain movie scripts. And then you'd see the movie and you'd be like, wait a minute, that was like nothing like the movie script. There were tons of things that were different. Let's see what's different with a James Bond movie script versus what we got to see. So I thought, let's take a look at Casino Royale. Screenplay by Neil Purvis and Robert Wade. Second set of revisions by Paul Haggis, it says... December 13, 2005, based on a novel by Ian Fleming. So this was revised December 13, 2005. And let's go ahead and let's go ahead and start reading some of it and see see uh, what some of the differences are. And we'll just kind of pause when we when we hit them. And I had a little glimpse when I first took a look at this. And already I was just like, wow, there are a lot of differences in the movie script versus what we saw in the movie. Casino Royale, Fade In, Exterior, Modern Office Block, Prague, Night. Snow on the ground, it's the middle of the night. A car pulls up outside the ultra-modern building. Dryden gets out and moves inside. Interior foyer, office block, night. Deserted except for the guard at the reception desk, Dryden mutters a greeting and heads for the elevator. Okay, so right there. Change number one. There was no guard at a reception desk, and Dryden did not mutter a greeting as he headed for the elevator, we just saw him go into the building, walking down a, a, some, just walking down a hallway kind of thing, and and then going straight to his office. There was no guard there. Okay. Exterior cricket ground day. We're in Lahore, Pakistan. A game in progress. The Pakistani team fielding. British team batting. The grandstand is crowded. The bowler hurls the ball. The batsman hits it up in the air, arcing it toward the stands. The crowd reach for it. One person catches it, throws it back. Standing next to the thrower is a dark, well-built man applauding the shot along with everyone else. Call him Fisher. He glances back at a rowdy group of fans and spots a man watching him, his face in silhouette. Bond. Fisher reacts, pushes through the crowd, away from silhouette. Interior, modern office night. Sleek surfaces lit only by the skyline beyond, Dryden enters, moving quickly to a hidden safe without bothering to turn on the lights. He stops dead when he sees it ajar. Dryden turns and sees Bond sitting in the shadows. Bond. M really doesn't mind us making a little money on the side, Dryden. She would just prefer it wasn't by selling secrets. And then it cuts to an exterior scene again. So here, um, so this this is a lot different. And uh, the exterior that we had before was not at a cricket game. Okay, so here we go. E exterior, cricket ground, day. A roar from the crowd. The batsman has been bowled out. Fisher jumps over the edge of the stand, moves down the tunnel. So now we're in a tunnel, passing the new batsman on his way out. He ducks around a corner into a dark corridor, leans against the wall. 
The, do the door at the far end of the corridor opens. Fisher spins to see Bond walking toward him. Fisher bolts. Interior. Uh, modern office. Night. So we're back in the office. Dryden switches on his desk lamp and sits as cool as an autumn evening. In that same motion, he flicks open a hidden panel in his desk, revealing the butt of a semi-automatic. Dryden. If the theatrics were supposed to scare me, you have the wrong man, Bond. If M were so sure I was bent, she'd have sent a double O. Benefits of being section chief. I'd know if anyone had been promoted to double O status, wouldn't I? Your file shows no kills. And it takes, Bond, two. Dryden tries not to show he is suddenly unnerved. Dryden smiles to cover. You aren't a cricket fan by any chance, are you? Oh, see, now, okay, this was not part of the conversation. This is getting interesting. Interior, cricket ground, clubhouse, day. Fisher races up a narrow staircase, leading to a balcony restaurant. It's a dead end. He pushes through a side door, runs down a long corridor, bursts into a restroom. Okay, now that's that's where... That was the scene that we were jumping back and forth between uh, what was going on with uh, in the office building and Bond's mission uh, before. So the, now we're in the restroom. It's empty. He whirls, drawing a gun, pointing it back at the door, waiting for Bond to appear. All right. Back to the office building. Interior, modern office, night. Dryden grabs the pistol. Levels it. Bond still hasn't moved. Shame. We barely got to know each other. He pulls the trigger. Click. Bond holds up the magazine. I knew where you hid your gun. I suppose that's something. True. Lays gun down. How did he die? Your contact? Interior. Cricket ground, clubhouse, day. Fisher backs up to a wash basin, turns on the tap, throws water on his sweating face. His eyes never leave the door. Suddenly a burst of cheering from outside. Fisher instinctively brings the gun up. A second door behind him crashes open. Bond. He spins, but James grabs him, knocks the gun out of his hand. Fisher attacks. The two tumble into the stalls. The fight is chaotic, both men trying to hit each other in a confined space until the stall partitions fold like dominoes. They fall into the shower room. Fisher fights like a madman until finally Bond forces his head into the basin, now overflowing with water. James holds him under until the body stops writhing and kicking. Not a clean kill by any means. He lets the body slide to the floor, steps back, considers, considering the dead man hating him for making this feel so much like killing. Interior, modern office, night. Bond, not well. Dryden, made you feel it, did he? Sees the truth in Bond's eyes. Well, no worries. The second is, Bond raises his silent Walter and fires, cutting off the words before they reach Dryden's lips. Yes, Considerably. Bond holsters his weapon and heads for the door. Interior, cricket ground, restroom day. Bond heads to retrieve his gun, senses movement, glimpses Fisher's reflection, aiming a pistol at Bond's back. Framed against white tiles, Bond whirls and fires one shot from the Walter. We are looking along the inside of the barrel of Fisher's gun. Red blood starts to flow down the screen. This is the iconic James Bond logo. Main titles. Oh, so they even describe the main titles. Photos from Bond's CV, including his stint in the SAS, intercut with a high-tech printing press. The sequence ends with crime scene photos of the two killings, Dryden and Fisher. Oh, now that's interesting. After each killing, Bond's ID badge is stamped with a with an O until it is laminated as 007. 
A hand places the ID badge in the folder with the photos, and the unseen clerk carries it off into the bowels of MI6. Exterior, jungle camp, Uganda, day. Superimpose, Gulu, Uganda. Pouring rain, the place is overrun with ragged, battle-scarred troops of a rebel army. A great majority of them are children, disturbingly thin. Some are as young as ten, every one of them armed. A few boast car carbons, but most carrying machetes. Follow one of the youngest carrying two bottles of Coca-Cola running through the mud until he dis disappears into a dark shack. The boy hands the drinks to a man silhouetted against the window. Call him Stephen Obano. He thanks the boy in his native tongue. The boy beams and sits at his feet. Obano hands a cola to a man hidden in the shadows, his dark gold-rimmed glasses glittering. Call him Mr. White. Obano looks out the open window and we see his face and understand why he is the feared leader of the Lord's Resistance Army. He gazes at the Twin Star helicopter in the nearby clearing. Obano, I think the Lord wants me to have a Twin Star. Mr. White, take it. It's unguarded. Obano laughs. With only an army to protect me. I value my life, thank you. Strokes the boy's hair. Last week I told this boy the Lord was displeased with his parents. He slit their throats. Now I know I can trust what he gives me to drink. How do I trust this man that I've never met with our money? Continued Mr. White. You asked for the introduction. That's all I guarantee. Three SUVs pull up to in the distance. Out of the first steps, a man we will come to know as the chief. Bodyguards climb out of the rear two and remain by their vehicles. Obano sits next to his grizzled lieutenant, flanked by some of the uh, fiercest looking rebels one would ever want to see. The room is dark, the light fighting, fighting its way in through the cracks in the boards that cover the windows that run the length of the room. Obano stares across the long table at Lashif, who doesn't break a sweat. Lashif, our friend will have told you that I have provided reliable banking services for many other freedom fighters over the years. Obano, do you believe in God, Mr. Lashif? Lashif, no. I believe in a reasonable rate of return. Lashif knows this was the wrong answer and clearly doesn't give a, a hoot. <laughs> Obano smiles. Obano, I want no risk in the portfolio. Lashif, agreed. Obano nods and three metal boxes are placed on the table. One of the men opens the closest box, displaying the money. Lashif takes a hit from an inhaler. Obano, and I can access it anywhere in the world. Lashif, hands him a business card. I have locations at most major airports. Exterior, jungle camp. Moments later, the chief climbs into his SUV as his bodyguards load the metal boxes into the center one. Interior, SUV. As they move off Valenka, the chief's beautiful Russian bodyguard dials a satellite phone. Valenka, into the phone. One moment. She hands the phone to the chief. The chief, into the phone. I have the money. Short another million shares. Interior, stockbroker's office, London, day. A dignified, gray-haired broker sits behind a large mahogany desk. We can see St. Paul's Cathedral out the window. Broker. Sir, you must know you're betting against the market. No one expects the stock to go anywhere but up. Interior SUV. The chief. Hanging up. Just do it. Interior dark shack. Mr. White watches as the SUVs are swallowed up by the jungle. Exterior. Commune Madagascar Day. So Madagascar. We're watching a fight to the death between a cobra and a mongoose. The arena is a derelict empty swimming pool. The audience, hundreds of screaming men urging the animals on. Beyond this, a cluster of crowded shacks and deserted buildings housing their near starving families. From a second floor, we see a man looking down at the spectacle. James Bond almost unrecognizable part of scenery. He keeps his eye on a disheveled young man amongst the excited crowd. 
The youth wears a small backpack and has a white, livid burn scar on his right arm. Carter. Bond's team mate is also in the in the crowd watching. Carter. Into a hidden microphone. He looks like our man. He has burn scars on his right arm. Bond. I wonder if bomb makers are insured for things like that. Two chirps. Bomber flips open his cell phone, reads what must be a short text message, then stands and pushes through the crowd heading in Carter's direction. Carter's hand goes to his earpiece. He's on the move. Bond, stop touching your ear. Carter automatically reaches up to touch his earpiece again. Sorry? Realizing his mistake too late, Bomber sp spots at him. Spooked, he charges off, leaping into the pool and running. Carter races after him, drawing his gun. Bond sees this. Put the bloody gun away. I need him alive. Carter goes to jump in the pool, trips, and falls headlong into the bottom. The gun fires wildly in the air, sending the crowd into panic, people diving in all directions. Bomber is already racing down an alley through the shacks, heading for the jungle beyond. Bond has taken a shortcut over the roofs, leaps down, is right behind him. Okay, so some of this... You know, some of this was very much the same as what we saw in the movie. There were a number of few things that were different, uh, but it, it's interesting, right? It's kind of interesting to, to hear the script or read the script versus what we saw in the movie and see the things that they took out. The whole cricket game uh, towards the beginning. So they really shortened what was going on when Bond um, killed his first you know, his, had his first kill as, um, so that was shortened to just the bathroom. Um, and it sounded like he was also drowned in the toilet, um, and not in the sink. So, so that was a little bit of a change. I'm sure that was, you know, people probably didn't, they probably figured people in the audience didn't want to see somebody's head get shoved in the toilet. Um, so that's probably why they made that change. But uh, no, some interesting changes. Now I remember when I I read the script, I read the movie script before I saw the movie, and that was um, Tomorrow Never Dies. And I actually read the script prior to seeing it, and so I was expecting a completely different opening because in the script, so in the movie, right, Bond just appears at the. Uh, where they're selling weapons and all these arms dealers are gathered uh, up there selling weapons in the movie script. There's a, you see bond get to this, the mountaintop where all of them were. He is client. He's climbing an ice waterfall, a frozen waterfall, all ice. And he's climbing that to get up to the top where all the arms dealers were up there. So that was in the script. It was not in the movie. So I remember, yeah, I remember uh, a little disappointed because that would have been cool to see. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed this video. Might do it again. We could do it with some other scripts if if uh, if you think it's a good idea. Anyway, um, we'll see you in the next video. Everybody, take care. All right, bye.